for, for plebs, by plebs, dropping the Bitcoin only signal. Pleb underground. Welcome everyone to the Pleb Underground. Welcome back, everyone. Pleb Underground, episode 94. I am solo. Walton is at the Bitcoin Beach Retreat doing his MC thing. But don't worry, guys. We've got a great show. We've got an awesome guest, and we're about to introduce him. Here we go. Joining me today on Pleb Underground is a fellow Bitcoiner that I got to meet at BTC++. Kind of blew my mind with what he was doing. I was very, very skeptical. I am talking about Carlinho, who is the elections lead at Simple Proof. Carlinho, thank you so much for joining me on the Pleb Underground, man. This is an honor. It's an honor for me to be here. Hello, fellow plebs. Awesome. All right, look, before we get into before we get into the everything Simple Proof. We're going to first just run through some stuff that, you know, the viewers are used to. We're going to dive right into the numbers. The numbers, of course, brought to you by Time Chain Stats and Time Chain Calendar. Guys, at the time of this recording, the block height is 851,861. The Bitcoin Fiat Exchange, ooh, 58K gang, back in 58,131. Ah, uh, Big Macs to BTC. That's right, guys. McDonald's is starting to win a little. You're only getting 11,280. Oh, 288 Big Macs. Getting more Big Macs. <laughs> Anyways, that's not good. We want less Big Macs. Um, no, wait, we want more Big Macs. That's right. <laughs> we want more Big Macs. Anyways, total public lightning capacity, 5,275. The fastest fee. Uh, yeah, the ordinals and runes down bad. Nine sats per V byte. And Moscow time, 1720. The numbers, Carlino. This is how we. Uh, this is how we intro the show. Get everybody warmed up. You know, with with some numbers. What are your What are your thoughts? Any thoughts on on the numbers at all? Um, I actually uh, knife caught uh, 1776 a few days ago, and uh, you know, just to screenshot that. So I love me some numbers and the Moscow time. Uh, 1776 on Fourth of July was uh, most epic. So. Okay, do you do you believe in con like I mean, do you believe in coincidences? Is that <laughs> I do not. Is that Satoshi, not crazy? Satoshi obviously has a plan, man, and we're we're just, you know, uh hashing hashing it out. Absolutely. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. All right. Well, look, you know what? We're not going to we're not going to beat around the bush. Um we th this is a it's a special format of this episode. The entire episode is an interview with you and talking about simple proof. So look, before we dive into simple proof, um, we're gonna back it up, and I want to know the I, I want to know the rabbit hole story. Where yeah, where did Carlino find Bitcoin? How did he find Bitcoin? And yeah, what what angle what angle are you coming from? Right on. Uh, well, so and as you said, I'm Carlino. That's how I'm known. I'm uh, born and raised in Guatemala. Uh, for those who don't know, that is in North America. It's the uh, region of Central America, the, the Balkans of the Americas, a good 14 degrees above the equator. So I know to you that is South America, but according to math and science, we are uh, above the equator. And um, it's, you know, next to Mexico. So it's like the, the, the next cul-de-sac over, right? Um, there's, you know, you have to go down to the border and then keep going. And then you get to the next border, you know, the, that's Guatemala right next door uh, to El Salvador. So we're in between El Salvador, which I'm guessing some of your folks uh, now know where that is and, uh, uh, and Mexico, right. And, and Belize really. So um, anyway, that born and raised here, uh, got a chance to go to uh, school in the States uh, back in, you know, graduate 2009. And uh, unfortunately, you know, didn't get exposed to the Austrian and 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 the Satoshi vision back then would have been awesome. Uh, so I had to come back uh, to the region, work, and uh, had the opportunity to help my dad with a uh, family business that he'd been running for over thirty years, doing gnarly engineering, building uh, massive metal structures in in the region, and you know. Super excited to actually have the opportunity to have my dad as my mentor, right? And so I was doing that, and um, overnight one day we read the 
newspaper and uh, we find out that two of our companies in our group were added to the OFAC list, which uh, I don't know if the plebs know what the OFAC list the, is. Can, can you give, if you can, give a little bit of a description for the people who, uh, who don't know about the, the OFAC compliance <laughs> or the, in this case, the OFAC list. <laughs> Indeed. So the OFAC list is run by the U.S. Department of Treasury. Specifically, it stands for Office of Foreign Asset Control, specially designated Narcotics Kingpin and Terrorist Watch List. And so, you know, after 30 plus years of working in Guatemala, overnight, we read the newspaper and like, what? Uh, uh, you know, two of our companies are next to, you know, Osama bin Laden, Kim Jong-un, and, and all these other, you know, colorful individuals that have been blacklisted. And what this means in, you know, the modern fiat world is financial death, Right. Uh, banks everywhere in the world are ordered to freeze all assets by any person on the OFAC list. You know, no questions asked, no due process, nothing, right? Uh, it is the ultimate uh, weaponization of the United States dollar. And it's how I found out that uh, Guatemala's constitution, banking system, you know, mm, you know, who, who cares? Uh, we promptly went to the central bank and the bankers are just like, hey, you know, where's you know, why are our funds frozen? Like we've been using these for over 30 years. Uh, we're we're kind of going out of business. So it's like, it's not like we're we're laundering money. Like wh where did this come from? And their response is, uh, you know, you know, there is no legal case against you in the Guatemalan justice system. But as soon as you get on this list, um, we are under threat that if we move a single dime of your accounts, then uh, our bank loses its SWIFT license. For those that don't know what SWIFT is, it's like the lightning network for the fiat system, right? And so the banker is like, so if I lose my SWIFT license, um, there's a run on the bank. And because of fractional reserve banking, if there's a run on this bank, then that means that the entire financial system of Guatemala collapses. Um, and so that's why individuals and companies who get on this list, um, you know, without due process, you know, they assume guilty until proven otherwise. And so, yeah, that was. So this sounds like a way of just making your opponents poor. Like it's... that that's really what it is. It, it just sounds like a way to just cut you off from liquidity and tie your hands. So it's, you know, some bureaucrats at the Department of Treasury for whatever per, you know reason, you know, put something in a database and all of a sudden, like if you get on it, you know, that's it. It's lights out. And uh there's no warning, you know, literally we found out the day that our funds were frozen. And so that's um, how I find out, I find out and, and discover the uh, importance of censorship resistant money and the lack of having it and realizing, you know, it's better to, to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. And basically, you know, the OFAC list is this scarlet letter as well, right? Obviously, all of our competitors are across the region. You know, we, we've been working in Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras. We built over 30 million square feet of roofing in the region. And all of our competitors are, are having a field day saying, oh, you know, those, you, 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 you shouldn't trust those guys. And, you know, immediately 30 years of proof of work is irrelevant, right? Uh, some bureaucrat in Washington, nameless, faceless, and their you know uh, pundits in the press put you out there, and immediately no one cares what you've done and and your history. It's uh, if I associate with this person, I may be persecuted myself, right? And the famous you know if uh, when they came for so and so, I said nothing. When they came for so and so, I said nothing. And now that they've come for me, and you know in hindsight, I now consider it lucky, right? Because because I was one of the first so-and-sos. <laughs> so it's like, I didn't even get a chance to uh, be the last guy, right? I, I was like one of the, the, the first ones there. And, you know, I just tried to help my dad over years to, to, to uh, weather this storm. And we ultimately went out of business and, you know, took like five, six plus years of just going further into debt, trying to, you know, save, save you know, a, a family legacy and, and burying it. And you know, when you when you go through something like that, you it's hard to unsee uh, the world, right? And you know, it just put, to me revealed that capitalism no longer works, right? And and then you know, down the rabbit hole of actually capitalism doesn't really work since you know the Jack, you know, creature from Jekyll Island emerged, and you know, uh, central banking uh, as dictated by Karl Marx in the Communist Manifesto started to be used in the dollar system, and and you know, it's just 
hijacks uh, capitalism and, and realizing this isn't capitalism, right? This is some some you know weird place that we found ourselves into, and eventually, uh, you know, Bitcoin fixes this, right? So uh, throughout that saga, which was years, and and you know, I was at one point suicidal, and and you know, my dad almost died, and. Um, you know, just feeling like, you know, what's the point, right? Like you do everything right. And then you build something for years, uh, decades, really across generations and, and still like just you get destroyed, right? Um, what's the point? But fortunately, some folks had exposed me to Bitcoin and I was starting to, to follow that. And, and really interesting. Um, unfortunately, what I'm on by got hit pretty bad by the it's blockchain, not Bitcoin, uh, you know, narrative. And so... Uh, I, I, you know, until COVID, I, 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 I was still, I would I'd call myself blockchain agnostic. Uh, I didn't really, you know, have an opinion about which chain mattered most. And mm. then through COVID kind of went down the rabbit hole again and realized, oh, so everything's a lie except for Bitcoin, right? And so um, anyway, as this process is unfolding, um, I had volunteered and participated uh, in our voting system, which uh, I, I was... It's it's a the sh short version is Guatemala had a revolution back in the eighties after about thirty years of having democracy where oh surprise the military junta decided or their candidate won right and you know imagine that you know the votes disappear into some basement and the, the military always wins right then these guys were trained at the school of the Americas um, and you know after thirty plus years after our you know. Who, who back in the 50s where, for those that don't know, um, the CIA's first coup was Iran and uh, the second coup was Guatemala, right? So, mm. you know, they, they, they'd they gotten like their, their one off and then they decided to keep practicing in, in our neck of the woods. And so after that, <laughs> when that happened in the 50s, we had about 30 years of this like, you know, nonsense democracy and you know people were fed up in the 80s and there was a, our last revolution in 1982 led to our current constitution in 1985 where our main thing that we fought for was recovering our democracy our voting system and the it was unique and looking back on it, it's like it was this perfect time in the mid 80s where you did have computers that you know d could do a lot of stuff in terms of mm -hmm. computing related to, for example, you know, computing votes quickly so that you knew quickly who was winning. Uh, but at the time you didn't have uh, computer and software at the point where like in the nineties, it evolved into electronic voting, right? So that mm. meant that Guatemala was in this unique historical moment where the best system that you could come up with was a paper-based, you know, vote where I'm a huge fan of paper and paper trails and auditability with paper, but combine that with some computing to, you know, try to basically process the paper quickly. Um, and the result is Guatemala has these voting tables where citizens are conscripted and called upon to volunteer in this volunteer army uh, that's decentralized. And you have, you know, a minimum of three citizens, um, maximum of five at a voting table handling 400 votes. And so as I'm going through the saga, I'm volunteering in, in this thing and I'm, and I'm learning about Bitcoin and I realized, wow, our voting system is essentially a proof of work consensus algorithm where mm -hmm. at the end of it, the, the consensus is who's, who's the result. But because is this, it's a decentralized proof of work consensus algorithm, these tables handling and protecting, custodying 400 votes to a table effectively are like, you could say mining nodes, or kind of coin join, you know, coordinators, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, or like validators. <laughs> well, um, so I, I, I see those. It's the, the work that they do, right? But so aren't they also a point of failure? Like, aren't they also a possible point of failure? For sure. Uh, oh. However, it's 400 votes to a table. And mm. so there's, in 2023, our last election, just last year, we had 9.2 million registered voters. So at around 400 votes to a table, that's 25,000 of these. So oh my God. if you want to attack the voting system of Guatemala, you have to corrupt 25,000 locations or you know, 51% attack uh, 25,000 of these uh, coordinators, these, these node operators. Um, and in, in physically how the system prevents this- Interesting. Is, they have uh, the political party witnesses 
can send uh, political parties, sorry, can send witnesses that literally stand right behind you the entire day. And so we, uh, the, the voting system eliminates any, you know, uh, arguments about the voting system after the fact. And it's the only moment where you can fight for the votes is on election day at the table, right? And so all the parties are incentivized to have a representative there and fight at the table, right? And so it's this beautiful process where because it's 25,000, around four people to a table. Last year, we had over 100,000 people mobilized. Um, and because we have like 20 parties competing, it's like on average something like five to 10 witnesses. So the estimates go from a minimum of 150,000 people doing this to upwards of 300 to 400,000 citizens. And of course, they all vote at the table. And so it, the result in 2023 was 4.2 million voters if you take 200,000 volunteers and witnesses, that's like 5%, right? So one in 21 votes, one out of 21 votes, more or less, is witnessed there physically in person and people duke it out and fight for it at the table. Um, and as the, the, the product at the end is a document that is coin joined because it's the 400 votes are distilled and assigned to the competing parties in that document. And that document is made public. So you allow anyone to audit the voting system. So it's mm -hmm. proof of work consensus algorithm that also leaves an audit trail. Anyone can access it, but you protect individuals' rights to privacy by mixing their votes amongst you know, about 400 of their neighbors, right? So it's completely transparent. Anyone can access it. It's literally done by the people. So this is like property of the people. Like the state cannot legally keep this a secret because it is made by us right mm -hmm. um and and so you know i was falling in love with this process and realizing wow like this is why proof of work consensus algorithms are so you know powerful and why we need to run nodes and and what the mining you know uh you know folks provide and and so just i realized i you know i'm not here to convince anyone anyone to believe in democracy uh i don't think you should that's up to you um what I am convinced of is the fact that voting systems create this proof of work consensus. And for better or worse, a lot of people out there in Normie land care a lot about this uh, particular consensus algorithm because it defines the transfer of power. And you know, plenty of people are convinced that it is legitimate, right? And so, mm -hmm. yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, I mean, if you're not, that's that's fine. It's, but because yeah, no, I know. I, I just I'm thinking about it, right? It's like yeah, I'd say the majority of people do believe that this process is legitimate. Yeah, and so <laughs> that's out there in Normie land. And so for me, it's mm. let's see this as an educational opportunity to reach these folks with a message of Bitcoin can protect democracy, and if Bitcoin protects democracy. If you are against Bitcoin, then you are against democracy. And so, um, you know, passionate about this, uh, became an election auditor. Had, it's, a, it's a much longer story, but basically, uh, as a result, now we very proudly at simpleproof.com, I joined the team in March mm -hmm. as elections lead. Uh, we are the first company, or the, com the, the company that got Guatemala to be the first country in the world to implement. Um, to use Bitcoin to protect its voting system at a nation state level. And so, yeah. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna stop right there. And now a quick word from our sponsor, Pet Rock Enjoyers in Disbelief. That's right, guys. This is the Bitcoin Relo Triangle, 16 ounces of solid titanium, beautiful craftsmanship, made by a fellow Bitcoiner. Check it out at cyphersafe.io. That is the Bitcoin Rolo Triangle. That dude, <laughs> that is absolutely an awesome story. Uh, obviously, uh, I was going to say as well, as you were explaining to me, you know, the story of your father's business and everything. I'm, I'm very sorry, right? Like, but at the same time, unfortunately, it's like, this is what creates who we are, right? Like, if you look, if you look back, it's like, unfortunately, I wouldn't be who I am without these experiences. So it's it's the double edged sword, right? And it looks like you've chosen to, you know, harness that, you know, that that negative energy will say into something positive, right? And that I, I think that's what's commendable, right? To see those situations play out and to say, I'm gonna I'm gonna change this thing. 
you know, I'm going to take this and I'm going to change it. So it's very, I'm, very cool. I'm, I'm thankful. I'm lucky. Like, thank you, faceless bureaucrat at the United States Treasury Department for ripping <laughs> off the Band-Aid. And I can never see the world the same again. And, uh, you know, I if that hadn't happened to me, maybe I'd be, you know, one of those normies that thinks that Bitcoin is, you know, for criminals and this and that and the other. And it's just... I don't see that. I realize now like Bitcoin is what gave me hope in these darkest of times. And I now my mission is how do I get my entire country and by extension Central America to see the Bitcoin as this tool, right? This this unique technology that can uh, is the most powerful tool available in the history of humankind to potentially avoid the end of the world. And so um, in the process, we also I see it as the fastest way to get Central America out of poverty. And uh, our greatest enemy in this region, and I'd say the world, is poverty, right? Like people, in, when they're, if you're on the fiat standard, you are by definition poor because uh, someone else uh, controls your money. So there is no way to not be poor if someone else controls your money. And uh, Bitcoin frees us from that. So, um, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So we, uh, as I, as I, as I, well, Stuff just fell. Anyways, uh, as I said before the show, um, we uh, I mentioned uh, in a clip this week that I was going to have you on the show. And right away, fellow Bitcoiner uh, mm -hmm. who watches the show uh, and uh, immediately commented uh, that that he thought that this, you know, this kind of sounds a bit like a like a scam. And I'm like, listen, I was very skeptical, too, when I met Carlino and he explained to me about how Bitcoin fixes voting. Now, the first thing I said to you when we said uh, when I first met when we first met at BTC plus plus is how are you doing this? How are you doing this without a shitcoin? Right. Because apparently ah. everything right. Everything gets fixed by Bitcoin with my magic shitcoin. You know, so so how did you uh, navigate? How did you guys navigate this? Because, look, I. You know what the problem is with Bitcoin, right? It's uh, when it comes to businesses, right? Uh, building around the Bitcoin ecosystem, um, it's difficult to make a profit. And this is why, this is why one of the reasons that there's so many grifters that introduce a shitcoin so that they can extract their value, right? Without actually providing anything. But in this case, you guys are actually using the Bitcoin network to to what to validate those all of those votes. Like, explain if you can in more detail. Like, how is it that Bitcoin is fixing the voting in in Guatemala? Well, um, thanks, and to to that user, thank you, sir. Uh, please uh, always be toxic and don't trust verify. Uh, he doesn't grifter, let me up for anything. Okay. <laughs> the grifters must be shooed away. Uh, but I invite you to actually, you know, don't trust verified. Like, don't trust me. Go and actually do this for yourself and check it because that's the beautiful thing about Bitcoin. So starting off of just like, what are we not talking about? We are not talking about a shit coin. We are not talking about some other blockchain. We are not talking about issuing tokens. We're not talking about a layer two that, you know, I promise, pinky promise, I'm not gonna, you know, rug you on or whatever. We are talking about hardcore on chain, you know, using Bitcoin as the time chain. So, um, and it's also not a new thing. So like, you literally don't <laughs> have to trust me. You, uh, I'm going to share my screen now. That's awesome. Please go to opentimestamps.org. Uh, Open Timestamps is a protocol that was nice. built by Peter Todd, a well-known Bitcoin core developer. This has been around since 2016, 2017. This is not a, like, I just came up with this last week to sell you a token. No, uh, I describe it as this is the compromise that emerged in 2016, 2017, when we went to war with each other about using Bitcoin as a database. Like the compromise between the money maximalists and the database you know, users is essentially open timestamps. And I have yet to find a single Bitcoiner. And I challenge you to, you know, you know, engage with me on Twitter and tell me why open timestamps is bad. I have yet to see a single one. And I know some pretty hardcore toxic maxis that would, you know, shoot me if I was, you know, bullshitting you. So, you know, but check it yourself. Go download the code, check out the GitHub. It's all open source. You're looking at it on my screen. This is at the core of what we did. And um, you know, obviously I'm not gonna go into the code, but there's this thing called stamp and verify. 
And so literally all that open timestamps does is I'm going to grab a JPEG from my desk right now, and I'm going to you know, drop it here. And boop, the magic just did that and prompted me to you know have this uh, what's called an OTS file. And mm -hmm. boom, all I have done is I have a JPEG on my personal server. I have downloaded a proof file from the open timestamps uh, dot org website, which is free. These are, you know, it's a free service that's been running for ages. And mm -hmm. all I need to do is keep this proof file, which is like a few bytes. Uh, well, you know, it, it's, you know, what, what is it? Four kilobytes? Uh, yeah, and, it's tiny. <laughs> and my original uh, JPEG or whatever, I could do a zip file of the size of the entire internet. Like famously, Peter Todd timestamped the entire internet archive when he started this. And so, there's a timestamp of like, and all of that information gets hashed and hashed and hashed and hashed into a single root hash that eventually gets sent on a transaction to Bitcoin. And so this is not JPEGs on Bitcoin. This is not, uh, you know, bloating the chain. This is potentially just one transaction per block uh, with a single hash on its op return function. And so op return is also prunable information so mm -hmm. I'm not forcing you to carry this information on your node. It's only those that choose to keep op return data on their node mm -hmm. have this. Um, and using that to uh, have a record of the entirety of the Guatemalan voting system. Um, and I am trying to get, move this, sorry. There we go. Okay. So check it yourself, opentimestamps.org, a protocol that's been going around for ages that all this ordinal and, and, and craziness, uh, you know, fight that has been going on for a year. I'm like, why aren't people talking about open time steps? Uh, and we just went ahead and used it. So uh, I'm going to be annoying. So, I got a question. Yeah, please, okay. So, so for me, I, I, what I see is, cause I'm trying to think of like points of failure and like, so the point of failure to me is like, so is it like an API that you're using? Or is is there an actual person that I know it's going to sound stupid, but is there like an actual person that is going and uploading the voting results to open timestamps? Like I'm trying to figure out if the sure. human factor is anywhere here. You know, so all all the code is there, and so you mm -hmm. could just download this yourself, nerd out on it, and then do what you know, create your own open timestamps implementation, and create what's called a calendar server mm -hmm. uh, that you run yourself and you're you know using your own node to do all of this running the, the software and you could generate your own proofs uh if you're that you know level of sovereign individual now most people aren't and so opentimestamps.org which and i think there uh peter todd has uh created a uh, nonprofit foundation in canada that runs this so mm -hmm. if you go to the website what you're doing is you're relying on the open timestamps foundation public calendar servers to do this for you. So technically okay. uh, you, there, you, uh, you, you can run it yourself just like you can run your own node, but if you don't want to, you can just use the public information. And as long as you keep the proof, you could you don't rely on them in the future. Once you have the proof, all you rely on is do you have your own node? And you could check the, that the proof is, if you keep the proof on your file, on, on, on your server, you keep the original file, right? In this case, it was a JPEG. It could be a zip mm -hmm. drive with your entire, you know, laptop. Uh, you know, for example, um, Ross Ulbricht could have, bef you know, before he the he, the FBI caught him, could have grabbed his entire server, hashed it, and then proved that any files that you know appeared on his laptop after it was oh you know, yeah uh, taken over, you could prove that you know they were not there. I I. This is the screenshot. This is the hash. This is the what my uh, computer had the day it was taken from me. And if you, if if I never had access to it afterwards, so if new files came out, then that wasn't me. And I can mathematically prove it with Bitcoin. So it's not that you're trusting that I didn't know. This is on every every Bitcoiner has a proof that you can refer back to. But the cool thing is. It, and, and I'll, sh I'll show this graphically how it works out. It's um, as long as you have keep the proof and the JPEG on your server, all that Bitcoin has is a timestamp. And so you're just referencing a hash of a hash of a hash of a hash. And so the, the, the footprint on Bitcoin is minimal because 
the uh, responsibility of keeping the storage of the data and the proof is on the user, mm. right? So that's the magic of open timestamps and why it essentially makes a lot of you know crypto and blockchain applications, in my opinion, irrelevant, right? Because uh, if you can use Bitcoin, why would, like, why would you use <laughs> anything else? But we're not calling them evil. We're just saying there's no, no reason to use any of your stuff because Bitcoin is cheaper uh, and and more secure. So if if you have a more secure service that is uh, you know not cost prohibitive, why would you use anything else? Does that make sense? Yeah, but absolutely. Specifically, well, the cool thing is what you're seeing now is is uh, for the individual, right? So open time stamps has been easy for individuals. Uh, for a long time, but what um, we did is recognize it's open time times is similar to Bitcoin in that it's easy for an individual, but it's very hard for an institution, right? Mm. And so that's what simple proof is. We are making it simple to prove information on Bitcoin for gigantic institutions like governments. And our first client is what you see on your screen, which is the election authorities. Uh, public facing database. Uh, it is in the States is called election night reporting. So it's TREP. You can go and check this yourself. T R E P dot G T. You can go to this website and do exactly what I'm going to do right now yourself. Right. So again, don't trust verify. I, I need to zoom out a little bit. Don't do it on mobile. It's not really good for mobile. You just need to zoom out a little bit. Uh, yeah. des desktop is the way to go because you know, it's a government website. Anyway, I'm selecting the presidential election. You can read here, presidente. There are more elections, but let's not you know, keep them yeah. down that rabbit hole. <laughs> and what this website is saying is 121,227 uh, JPEGs out of this amount. So they're publishing 99.12% of the uh, entire you know, voting system. Mm -hmm. uh, I also have a link up here that says database. I could download the databases and if I scroll down, I'm looking at Guatemala's map. You know, there. If you hadn't seen it, that's what it is. Right next to Mexico, in between El Salvador and Belize, and then further down, these are the national totals. So all of these colors are all of the clowns competing in my clown world, uh, nice. and there are many. Right? We have the opposite of not enough choices. We have so many, many choices. Uh, <laughs> believe me, it doesn't get better with all these choices. But anyway. Um, here's, oh, this guy had 238,000 votes, uh, cool database, bro. How do I, you know, verify this? Right. And so, do you guys also have a geriatric circus or is it like younger people that aren't that, that, that are like a little more with it? <laughs> it's, there's a lot of circus work, uh, going, it's <laughs> not worth going into, uh, what matters is I don't believe them and I want to verify, right. I yes, was an election that's right. auditor. <laughs> <laughs> And so I don't believe well, them and I want to verify. <laughs> up here, there's this section called results by voting table. And there's this text box that I can input any number between one and 24,500. So yeah, which is the number of voting tables, as you indicated. What's your favorite number between one and 24,500? I've always been a big fan of the number um, 23,215. So it's just the best number. Yes. So... <laughs> We didn't agree on this, so I'm literally showing you like random numbers, right? So now instead of looking at the national total, the website's saying table number 23, 21, 5, voting center, 3,644, and the municipality, department, et cetera, right? So instead of looking at the national, we've honed in to the actual individual voting table. So instead of seeing hundreds of thousands of votes, you're seeing an individual table distributed amongst all what the What the results are from that table. That individual table, right? All Holy these clowns, shit, man. Uh, right. So these, these 24,500 tables, that's where the okay. national totals come from. I have to back up and ask you a question. So yeah. who sub so who is submitting these results, right? Like where is – like I, I get that there's the people working at those tables, but – what does that process look like? Like I'm, cause I'm assuming there is a person like it's like, you know, so yeah. We, we have, uh, we, we published a 15 minute documentary called immutable democracy that gives, I have like, links to that and we're going to put it in the show notes. Sorry, continue. 
well, it, it, it literally describes exactly that question. And the answer oh, damn, is... Damn, I should have watched the video. <laughs> Sorry. <no worries>. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. 15 minutes, immutable democracy. You can look for it on YouTube or go to film.simpleproof.com. But basically, we'll show you there how the process works. And so, yes, the individual citizens, your neighbor, well, my neighbors uh, did this, but then um, they have a copy that then they give to a dude at the voting center with a scanner. That dude scans it, generates the JPEG, which um, just to finish up, like up here is the like individual numbers of this uh, uh, table, right? But again, cool database, bro. Like, don't trust verify. If you keep going down, you can actually look, see find this ver button, which stands for verify or look. If mm -hmm. you click that, it brings up the actual JPEG, right? So now you're looking at the handwritten document that was uh, written by table number 232115, Gregorio, Evelyn, and Johanna, right? Uh, Phil and I didn't like agree to look at this one table, like, and, and there's 25,000 or 24,500. You could you know go to town, like do it. Um, I've I've wasted quite a lot of time doing this, so I'm, I'm comfortable with it. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> here these three people. This I is call insane. Them, yes, <laughs> I'm the, sorry. I'm like this yeah. is this is actually pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So I call these three guys up here uh, uh, that that uh, fill this in as the coin join coordinators or you know the mining nodes. Yeah. Um, and they're saying 189 votes uh, were cast, so we had 400, but only 189 bothered to show. And further down here, all of these clowns, this is how the 189 uh, were distributed. And here in the center, it's the totals. And then on the right-hand side, it's the signatures, right? So once they finalize the coin join, they sign it. Uh, up at the top are the three coordinators. And then below, you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven witnesses were present from political parties. So you, this, this thing represents... 10 different people from competing interest and, you know, from the citizens, from the parties, all duking it out over how do we distribute these 189? And once we reach consensus, we sign this document, right? And uh, it's yellow because it's the carbon copy duplicate uh, mm -hmm. of yeah. the original. And yeah. that basically gets shuffled away to, uh, you know, in, in the corner of the voting center, there's a dude with a scanner and he scans it, right? And so... That's how the data gets on the database. So the, the, the dude in the corner with the scanner is a private contractor uh, working for this tech company that did this website. So literally this website isn't simple proof. This is a third party contractor that built this thing that they're, you know the, it's the whole industry, the election night reporting industry that do these things. Um, and so you might have noticed there's a really you know strange you know and conspicuous orange button like that's a mm -hmm. very specific shade of orange yes it is and it says <laughs> you know it's in spanish but i would say you know e you know even plebs can recognize it sort of looks like it says verify hash which is exactly what it's saying in spanish verificar hash so when i click on that now we've left this third-party contractor, the official mm -hmm. elections website, and we are now in the immutable backup service that was built by Simple Proof and contracted by the election authorities. Um, and so what happens now, right? Essentially, it's Simple mm -hmm. Proof is publicly saying that on June 25th, 2023, at 1023 p.m., time zone minus GMT minus six, which is the, where I am in Guatemala, it's, it's our time zone. That's when this document appeared on our database. Why is that timestamp so important? Because we are looking at this JPEG on you know July, 2024. So over a year after the fact, mm -hmm. how do we know, how could we verify that this JPEG is actually the JPEG that was produced at that scanner on election night yeah. in Guatemala? How do we know that? Well, we use a clever use of open timestamps at scale. And so Simple Proof is saying our website uh, showed this JPEG at this hour, and we immediately took the SHA-256, which uh, do your plebs know what the SHA-256 is? Yeah. Excellent. Yes, they do. <laughs> so you but we'll pop it up it. anyways or something. <laughs> Basically, it's a very unique code. There are more of these in the universe than there are atoms in the universe. So the yeah. fact that this SHA-256 <laughs> corresponds to this JPEG, it starts with 91A6, right? Uh, you, you, obviously, you could ver verify the whole thing. but um, yeah. And what we're saying is that hash has a proof on 
the blockchain, which is seven on block number 795963. Why the blockchain? Because um, this is a government contract. And so never use the word Bitcoin when you're in a government contract. The blockchain, blockchain, blockchain is the way to go. But obviously, what chain has 795,996 blocks at in June 2023 and, and is you know orange? Well, uh, guess. And uh, uh, date and time of the confirmation of the block, June 25th, 2023 at 11, 13 p.m. in the time zone. So they are very publicly saying that, and I'll zoom out here, the time that Simple Proof had this JPEG on their servers is a max total of about, what is it, like 48 minutes or no, yeah, 50 minutes. Uh, between when it showed up on our servers and it was, you know, publicly available on uh, Bitcoin. So, sure, what happened to that file in those fifty minutes, and could it have been altered uh, potentially? But in two thousand nineteen, the last time that an election happened in Guatemala, uh, the documents didn't show up until six days after the election. And oh, so, wow. You know, yes, in this unique case, it's 15 minutes. Maybe there's that block took a while. Um, in general, it's 10 minutes. Uh, but you know, even though that is enough time to change the JPEGs, it's a, you know, it's 99% less of an attack surface than what happened in 2019. And the summary is in 2019, the election authority had people that were sent to jail on accusations of election fraud because of this fact that the yeah. documents weren't published until six days later. And so everyone's like, I can't, like, who can trust, can't trust that? Yeah, you can't no. trust that. That gives somebody totally enough time to change everything. And well, not everything, know, but to change enough. And so I'm, I'm, I'm all about, you know, the haters saying, oh, but, you know, 50 minutes is, is an eternity. Well, it's 99% it's, it's less of an eternity than six days are. And so for- That's a massive now, improvement, I think, that's worthwhile. Indeed. It's, it's yeah. a net benefit by far. Yeah. And so further down, what does the immutable backup allow you to do? As a private citizen wanting to verify and, and audit the, the election, you can view the file visually so that you could compare it to the one that I was showing to you earlier if you're a visual person, but that's kind of time consuming. So instead of viewing it, you could just download it and download all of them and then hash them all yourself and keep your backup. Like the immutable backup is a, a, a second redundant database that you can get all the data. However, it's also providing all the hashes and all of the OTS files, which again, open timestamps is what OTS stands for. Go to opentimestamps.org, read the Git. Um, and here you can download or view the proof. And so the actual proof- And the is hash matches. It's it's a gnarly, gnarly, you know, those that are cryptographically inclined, you know, you'll love this. This is like just proofs upon proofs upon proofs and the hashes upon hashes. Of course, our clients were like the media lawyers. And so it's like, how do you convince people that this is true? Well, we decided to create this thing called the OTS Navigator. So you click the button there that says view Merkle tree. Mm -hmm. so now we are creating this visual representation of how the OTS, um, the open timestamps protocol works. And so what you're seeing on your screen is what is referred to as a Merkle tree in a graphic interface where we go all the way to the bottom of the Merkle tree. And what do we there find? It is. The hash, right? 91A68F. And I can copy it. And then visually what we're saying is the, the hash above that one is, and here's the proof, the mm -hmm. um, appended hashes of another hash into a mother hash. And if you keep doing that, you can string all of these hashes together in an incredibly efficient manner where all you're doing is through this proof, you can see how this one unique hash, SHA-256, is a, a part of the Merkle tree that goes all the way to this Merkle root. And the difference between a Merkle root and a Merkle, uh, you know, a, a, or a leaf on the Merkle tree is um, you can still copy this, but the Merkle root contains a transaction ID. And so mm -hmm. you can use your own node to verify this transaction ID. We provide a link to mempool.space because we think that's a really cool block explorer. And so now we're inside mempool.space specifically looking at, and let me zoom out a little bit, um, specifically looking at transact this transaction that there has this timestamp, right? 
2238. This actually might even be earlier. What? Let's see. Yeah, it's actually earlier than this one. Um, we're still working. Basically, we have several calendars. So you see the timestamps actually earlier because we, in, in our uh, navigator, you can also click between different calendars. So we not only have mm -hmm. one calendar that proves this, we have, in this case, three different ones. And so we're actually looking at the, the one that had the earliest transaction. Um, and so we actually can prove this three different times if uh, one wasn't enough. Um, and so there's the timestamp. And if you keep going down, you look at the detail section of the input output, you mm -hmm. click Control F, you paste the uh, root hash, right? Going back here, we're looking at the root hash, B30F0. And sure enough, B30F0 is this SHA-256 that is on the op return function of this one transaction with mm -hmm. this timestamp. Therefore, what we have just done is created immutable uh, cryptographic proof that that JPEG that I showed you is at least as old as that transaction, right? And again, that isn't the panacea for election fraud, like something could have happened before, but in the case of Guatemala, 2019, they manipulated the data over six days. In 2023, they only have the space between blocks. Yeah. And so it is not the end all be all, this fixes absolutely everything, but when you eliminate 99.9% .9 of the attack surface, any would-be attacker is forced to just you know try to cram into that time. And so the only moment to commit fraud is at the very beginning on election night. Yeah. And when you're rushed, that's when you make mistakes. And when people make mistakes, doing a crime, that's when they leave evidence. And when they leave evidence, you can actually catch the people, the right people, and take them to jail for the right reasons, as opposed to arguing about, you know, your guy lost and my guy or whatever, right? So it's, um, that is literally what we did. And it's the first time that a nation state has done this at a national scale. In the case of Guatemala, 9.2 million registered voters. So I know the U.S. has more, but uh, hey, it's, uh, at least a start. And now, a word from our sponsor. Check out the awesome pins at btcpins.com. Use the code PLEB underground for 5% off awesome pins. Boom. Check out my awesome pin collection. That's right. Only at btcpins.com. Man, thank you so much for the deep dive into that. And as you were doing that, I was thinking, so I, I'm wondering what was... Like, what was it like to pitch this solution to the government and how exactly did you man, like, did, like, who did you have to get in front of to show this? And like, what was their initial reaction? I feel like, I don't know, because for me as a Bitcoiner, you just explained this to me and I see it and it makes sense. And I see why it's so incredibly better. So it's funny, Shinobi, you know, Shinobi, right? Yes. Yeah, right. So you know, so he calls you he calls you the the Machiavellian Bitcoiner. <laughs> Anyways, and I I I get this. Like I I can see it now. It's like holy shit. Like you just reduced. It, it's true. Like you just reduced that attack surface by at least ninety percent, and the amount of complexity that is involved in trying to tamper with that data in such a small amount of time. Like, dude, you just create, I think you just created like a crazy impossible challenge for the, for the voting fraudsters. But anyways, my, my, I'm, I'm blabbering my, my original question. Like, what was it like when, when you pitched this, like, what were the reactions? So I only joined the team in March. Um, and so, um, I was still an election auditor. So on election night, I'm connected. I, I don't trust these guys. I'm coming from 2019 where I think they stole the election. So I'm just ready to go. And then I see the orange button and I'm like, I can't believe it. Like, because I, I, I made recommendations back in 2019 to, to mm -hmm. specifically for this. And, you know, basically some friends uh, and, and started Simple Proof and, and pitched it. And, you know, they talked to me about it. I was like, dude, like, what are the odds? Like, they're not going to go for this. Like this, like it's, what government bureaucrat wants, crazy. To, like, like wants transparency? And they were like, no, we're going to do it. And, and you know, I, that's why it, it's, you shouldn't, 
my recommendation is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? Like um, we we should fight uh, to get this kind of technology in uh, into the bureaucracies and, and into government because fundamentally, like what what did they do? Like what did Simple Proof achieve here? Is in the case of this specific election, is now no one can can go back and change it, right? And um, famously, now that uh, Julian Assange is, is is free again, um, you know, some of, of his uh, speeches are, have started coming out. And he in 2014 was talking about what excites him the most about Bitcoin beyond the the, the money application is proof of publication. And he specifically cited Orwell's dictum, which for those that don't know is he who controls the present controls the past. He who controls the past controls the future. And that's been the case throughout the entire history of humankind, right? The history is written by the winners, right? And so what this means is we've, in the case of the Guatemalan election system, not, not the government, not any individual, not any hacker from any foreign state that wants to meddle with our democracy, no one can change the record, right? And so that is basically ending Orwell or breaking Orwell's dictum in this unique case. But it's not just an, a, a, um, a democracy you know, application. We believe, and the, the vision of Simple Proof is, we should demand as citizens from the government and put it into law that any public record, any time that a citizen interfaces with the state and gets a receipt for you know, traffic violation, you know, your, your license, I mean, or the, the, the voting records, like anything that the state publishes to the internet, should by law be required to carry a timestamp that has immutable characteristics, I think, because that is how we eliminate the ability of anyone, including the state or enemies of the state or ourselves to change the records, right? Um, why did the, the, the government official in Guatemala go for this? Well, I didn't go into detail, but in 2019, people went to jail that used to work at the election uh, authority because they completely mishandled, they botched it, they completely dropped the ball. It just, it was a nightmare. Uh, for the first time in over 30 years, the election was, like, there were people on the right, on the left, on up, down, like the you know, giants and, and tiny people, everyone was, was calling the election in 2019 a fraud. And so there, there was this like scar tissue from 2019 where when, they were shown this they were like all right that like th th their 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 pushback was i mean this sounds too good to be true how much is it going to mm -hmm. cost us and that's like well it's actually cheap because we are efficient smart users of bitcoin and it's it this isn't expensive if you're not issuing nfts right like because all we care about is a hash of a hash right like it, it could be a trillion jpegs on a single transaction and so it um they just they saw it as insurance, right? So for bureaucrats, wow. uh, for us, it's, hey, man, the election, it, it, it's impossible to predict how an election is going to go on, you know, basically up until the moment that it happens, right? And so the bureaucrat that's actually in charge of managing it, uh, they're on the hot seat, right? If, if the outcome is not cool with the regime, and this is what happened in Guatemala, they're the messenger. And immediately the regime turned around and shoot the messenger, right? Like they were, they were, they actually fled the country like Guatemala's national election authorities, who are like some of the highest judges in the land. Finalized the election results, got on a plane and, and literally fled to the United States in October. And, That's you know, insane. Because the, 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 there was a weaponized justice system. And this is why you should watch our 15 minute film. Yes. You know, the, the weaponized justice system accused them of fraud and tried to put them in jail in order to. Uh, coerce them to repeat the election because they, what they wanted was to repeat the election because their guy lost and they've been in power for 80 years. And so it's like, let, let's do a do-over, right? And so they left the country. And now that they're back, because we fortunately were able to get um, the winner of the election, there was no repeat, but the winner uh, has taken control of, of the executive since mm -hmm. January. And so the election authorities came back in February, presented themselves in court, paid $150,000 in bail, and the, the the trial is ongoing. Like a few weeks ago, the evidence was presented against them, which you know I can share my screen again mm -hmm. in terms of like why, like not only did we convince them that this was uh, you know valuable, but um, we also you know are helping them out. So I was. Uh, showing you like they hired this as insurance policy and so 
did the insurance work? Well, they've been accused of election fraud and there's a trial. And so what you're looking on your screen now is on the x-axis, it's the time starting mm -hmm. at zero on election day, going all the way to about 50 hours, right? So this is like about two days, the, the start of election day and two days after. And then on the y-axis is the number of JPEG files. Um, you'll see at hour number 18 on election day, that's when the polls close, right? So we, we uh, point to that hour because that's when these JPEGs should have been created. And so the election crimes unit is arguing that the smoking gun evidence is that 3% of the JPEGs, this tiny little you know thing here, was created, has a timestamp in its JPEG metadata that is prior to 6 p.m. on voting day. Therefore, indicating that these JPEGs were cooked, you know, the, 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 the books were cooked prior to the voting and then somehow got sneaked mm. in. And so there's like, this is the smoking gun and evidence that the election authorities are guilty of fraud. And I was like, that, that, that doesn't make sense. This is what's on Bitcoin overlaid on top of what the election crimes unit is arguing in court. And you see that it these in the gray, the three like little humps smooth over into one just bell curve, right? One normal looking curve. So mm -hmm. how is it that Bitcoin has different data? Well, I can't really speak to the 3%, but I know for a fact that this data over here technically came from the future. <laughs> and so the fact that the election authorities use Bitcoin to create an independent timestamp um, yes. Com compared to what the election crimes unit, you know, <clears throat> evidence is, proves that mathematically you have to prove that time travelers came from the future and inserted data into Bitcoin, and then fifty percent of it came afterwards. So I'm a lot more interested in this: what the hell happened in this fifty-three percent than I am in the three percent. Yeah, that's a bigger, bigger, you know, explanation. And so one one explanation is time travelers, right? That that's that's one explanation. Ooh, crap. Let me let me get the other one. I, I hadn't put it up yet. No worries. Uh, the other explanation is what you're seeing now, which is three percent of the scanner hardware had a misconfiguration of the time zone and thought that they were in West American West or Samoa, no American Samoa, um, out in the Pacific Islands, like GMT, like ten or so hours earlier. Yep. And then 53% of the scanners had a misconfigured time zone, having those scanners in Iraq, in Baghdad. Um, and if you use that more plausible explanation and you correct for the time zone error, it matches perfectly with what's on Bitcoin, right? And so this is not something that we could have predicted was going to be the evidence presented against the election authorities as proof positive of, of you know, election fraud. But mm -hmm. because they use Bitcoin, they have, you know, something that's true, right? Something that is that's beautiful, right. something, something that's mathematical. They and had so, a proper meter stick. Exactly. So when you actually anchor yourself to reality, <laughs> right? When you have a, a an anchor of truth in a sea of lies, then instead of arguing past each other, we can say, all right, let's just, you know, talk about what we can agree on, which I would hope is mathematics, and then consider what are the most plausible explanations. And so in this case, that's how it worked out. I'm not you know, going to say this is always going to be what happened, but really you could make the argument that Guatemala's democracy almost collapsed because someone misconfigured you know, time zones in scanners. Yep. And so it's like, how ridiculous, like, I forget what the, the idea is, but it's like, how the, 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 the the craziest or the funniest explanation is is more often the right one, right? It's 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 not the simplest explanation. It's it's the stupidest, basically. Like, um, See? it's the human right? error, right? It's the human factor. That that's why I keep pointing. I'm trying to figure out where the because that is a perfect example of how the you insert the human into the equation, and that's where your failure point is, because. Uh, and it's funny that you brought that that you brought that up as an example because uh, I used to work in access control and access control often deals with timestamp servers and being able to tie events and card reads to specific things that happened in specific buildings and we would often get similar we would get calls where people would say listen you know your thing isn't working right we're seeing valid card reads and there's no person standing at the door and then lo and behold 
it, it's just a broken timestamp server. The reader was set to a time zone that was somewhere else, you know? So of course nobody's reading their card there then, you know, like stuff like that. It's just, yeah, man, it, it's, and of course, what was it? Human error. And, and you know, you know? obviously that, that's what happened here. And so the, the, oh, the yeah. didn't really understand. They just, just, all right, this is cheap insurance for our digital information. And we, we have these contractors, we, we don't really trust them. And so, you know, if, if it's not too expensive, which it isn't, then let's have this backup plan, this insurance policy in case the shit hits the, hits the fan. In the case of elections, you're basically guaranteed that the shit's going to hit the fan, man. Like it's, it's, mm. It's like if you're not investing in some cheap insurance on, you know, your digital files being hacked, you know, uh, there being a, a flash flood, I mean, whatever it is, like just have redundancy. But in our case, what we provide is not only is it a backup, but it's also a backup that's, you know, time stamped to Bitcoin so that you have this anchor. And it's like you don't need to trust us. It's like all open source protocols. You just need to run the map yourself and look at it. Right. And then. You know, at, when you have this anchor, as as the dust is settling, you can actually get to uh, a clearer picture of what's real. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, now we're really excited because our message out there is yes, uh, you know, people you know, to, to the plebs. It's I'm not here to convince you about democracy. I'm here to say, <laughs> do this for Bitcoin. Right? Yeah, like, this is about creating a strong case for Bitcoin is an anchor of truth in the sea of lies. And come November, you can bet that it's going to be a shit show. The places that have this will withstand the onslaught of chaos that will likely come for them. And in most cases, because, and I'll you know, explain for those that don't know, you know, because the US is 50 states, each one has its own election law, and the election authorities responsible for implementing that more often than not are your local county clerks. So it's the local government, not the feds, right? It's one of your neighbors is the guy that's in the hot seat come November, and they probably have no clue about how cryptography and, 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 and Bitcoin works. And so this could be a, a perfect opportunity. And that's what we've seen here of just now it's easier for me to orange pill the election authorities, the president that won, his staff, people in, in Congress, judges who all heard about this. And I can now talk to them, see, you know, about what happened with, with, with the election, right? It's like everyone knows about this. Mm -hmm. And it's not me talking to them about Bitcoin and it's like the best asset and you're, you know, have fun staying poor. And, and I'm all for those arguments. That's like, not going to work though with them. <laughs> Like <laughs> if you want to, if you want to scream at them, you have you know, to have fun for. For. it's like, you know, go for it, but don't be surprised when that's not going to bring too many new people to the movement. Right. But this it's truth, right? It's literally like, Hey man, what do you think is more plausible S human error with the, 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 the time zone or time travelers from the future, you know, Rick and Morty decided to show up and commit election fraud. Um, so um, our uh, we're very excited to do this. If you care about this, see it as an opportunity to reach your neighbors and bring timestamping to your local government. Because once we get it into the election system, it's a lot easier to take to other places. We literally yesterday implemented our first, uh, our, sorry, our second client, and it's no longer the election authority. So it's like once this use case is out there, people are like, I I want some of that, right? Like. Mm -hmm. In, in this day and age, you know, cheap insurance is, is always good. Okay. I have a question now. Uh, it's probably going to be my last question because this, the whole hour flew by, man. You did such an amazing job explaining <laughs> in great detail. You sold me on this. Um, but okay. Uh, my question to you is this, if you can, if you can share, it's okay if you can't. Yeah. Um, so since you've proven this and you explain how it's easier now to, you know, explain to governments, right. They can see the value in using a system like this. So what's been the feedback or like, is it like you just explained that you have a, a new client that is not uh, from what it sounds like, not elections related. So my, my curiosity is, can you share what industries uh, have reached out? Not necessarily the customers, because I know that that's not, you know, you can't always give that, but if you yeah, can tease the industries. Uh, logistics, um, oh. you know, uh, tech providers for uh, government, uh, especially those related to, to, to the justice system, uh, you know, evidence, uh, you know, 
anything that it can eventually make its way into a court proceeding, mm -hmm. like there's this is this is very useful. <laughs> so, um, but it's that's in Guatemala, right? And so what we have, have seen is all right. We 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 show this um, in the elections, and it gets the word out. And it's also you know because this isn't necessarily new. There, I mean, we've been talking. Bitcoiners have been talking about timestamping for a while, but mm -hmm. uh, we're the first ones to do this. And you're almost like, how is it that we're the only ones that have done this? And I find that it's because <laughs> I'll tell you why. Well, I, I'd say that it's, um, it's elections are because are, you don't are, have a shit coin. Well, there there are that's another argument. We're the only people in Bitcoin doing this, but there are a bunch of crypto people doing this. Oh, of course to, there to are. Bit, to Bitcoiners, it's like the the shitcoiners are coming for this uh, industry, right? So if we don't beat them to it, then all of a sudden maybe you know Cardano yep. or Polygon become the standard for this, right? But they're presenting a walled garden though. See, this yeah. is where it's different, right? So I totally get it. They can quote unquote offer what is seemingly the same functionality, but the the base system as we know, I mean, it, it's not the same quality here. We're talking Bitcoin. You know what I mean? We're talking about actual immutable proof, not fucking uh, Cardano Foundation and, uh, you know, Charles Hoskinson approved. Sure, so, but, but, yes. but we need the use case out there so we can point to it. Yes, right? so that to say, look, like, this works. This actually happened and, it, and it's in there, right? So yeah. um, we, we, we want to sprint. And so we're going for it. And, and so far, the response is, you know, Bitcoiners that have listened to this through other shows that have gone mm -hmm. down the rabbit hole have verified and can con have confirmed for themselves that this is all open source and, you know, they've reached out and they're like, I want to help you. And so we have like eight different Bitcoiners in eight different states actively going to their local county clerks and just asking for a meeting. And, and literally, it's just like, show up and ask stupid questions, you know, show up and be like, I'm your neighbor. Do you have a plan come November in case the shit hits the fan? Because... Yeah. Just so you know, there's this, you know, I don't leave, think they do, you know, it's like leave this, leave our, our, our card, leave, no, just give them the information. Like, just so you know, in Guatemala, there are some judges that were accused of election fraud and they're using Bitcoin to protect themselves and it's cheap. So if you reach out to us, we can also offer like if, if your introduction uh, leads to an actual contract, we can offer a referral fee. So ask about that. But the, the point is, let's not let this opportunity come November go to waste. Not because of democracy, but because a lot of people care about this. And if Bitcoin protects democracy come November, then by December, we can credibly make the case that Bitcoin protects democracy. Therefore, if you are against Bitcoin, you're against democracy. Damn. All right. Straight fire. OK, so look, we're going to unfortunately we got to wrap it up, man. But that that was a great way to that was a great way to end it. But look, um, where if people want to find you, right, shill your shill your links, let people know where can they find you? Where can they get all this stuff? And guys, all of this information is going to be in the show notes. So you don't have to sit here like frantically trying to type this stuff out or whatever. But do it, my friend. Where can they Thank find you? you? <laughs> Simpleproof.com is the best way to, to reach out to us and find all of our information. We have a YouTube channel with our with our uh, uh, movie. Uh, we're also on Noster because uh, we got canceled off of Twitter pretty quickly because elections in Bitcoin are like immediately you get up, off. I've somehow survived. And so you can find me personally on Twitter and and, and we'll engage, I hope, uh, on Twitter with, with uh, Pleb Underground. So re you know, my DMs are open. Reach out to me on Twitter. Email us, visit our website. Um, let's do this, right? Awesome. Absolutely awesome. Guys, that info is going to be in the show notes. And guess what? This this does it for this episode of Pleb Underground. Don't forget to check us out on our audio-only platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Anchor. If you want to stream us sats, check us out on fountain.fm. And guys, I can't believe I'm going to say this. Bitcoin may just fix voting. Catch you all next week. Peace.